This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. My Mark Twain by William Dean Howells Chapter 4 Clemens had appointed himself, with the architect's connivance, a luxurious study over the library in his new house. But as his children grew older, this study, with its carved and cushioned armchairs, was given over to them for a schoolroom, and he took the room above his stable, which had been intended for his coachman. There we used to talk together, when we were not walking, and talking together, until he discovered that he could make a more commodious use of the billiard room at the top of his house, for the purposes of literature and friendship. It was pretty cold up there in the early spring and late fall weather, with which I chiefly associate the place, but by lighting up all the gas burners and kindling a reluctant fire on the hearth, we could keep it well above freezing. Clemens could also push the balls about, and without rivalry from me, who could no more play billiards than smoke, could win endless games of pool, while he carried points of argument against imaginable differers in opinion. Here he wrote many of his tales and sketches, and, for anything I know, some of his books. I particularly remember his reading me here his first rough sketch of Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven, with the real name of the captain, whom I knew, already from his many stories about him. We had a peculiar pleasure in looking off from the high windows on the pretty Hartford landscape, and down from them into the tops of the trees, clothing the hillside by which his house stood. We agreed that there was a novel charm in trees, seen from such a vantage, far surpassing that of the farther scenery. He had not been a country boy for nothing. Rather, he had been a country boy, or still better, a village boy, for everything that nature can offer the young of our species and no aspect of her was lost on him. We were natives of this same vast Mississippi Valley, and Missouri was not so far from Ohio, but that we were akin in our first knowledges of woods and fields as we were in our early parlance. I had outgrown the use of mine through my greater bookishness, but... I gladly recognized the phrases which he employed for their lasting juiciness and the long-remembered savor they had on his mental palate. I have elsewhere sufficiently spoken of his unsophisticated use of words, of the diction which forms the backbone of his manly style. If I mention my own greater bookishness, by which I mean his less quantitative reading, it is to give myself better occasion to note that he was always reading some vital book. It might be some out-of-the-way book, but it had the root of the human matter in it, a volume of great trials, one of the supreme autobiographies, a signal passage of history, a narrative of travel, a story of captivity which gave him life at first hand. As I remember, he did not care much for fiction, and in that sort he had certain distinct loathings. There were certain authors whose names he seemed not so much to pronounce as to spew out of his mouth. Goldsmith was one of these, but his prime abhorrence was my dear and honored prime favorite, Jane Austen. He once said to me, I suppose after he had been reading some of my unsparing praises of her, I am always praising her, 
you seem to think that woman could write. And he forbore, withering me with his scorn, apparently because we had been friends so long, and he more pitied than hated me for my bad taste. He seemed not to have any preferences among novelists, or at least I never heard him express any. He used to read the modern novels I praised, in or out of print, but I do not think he much liked reading fiction. As for plays, he detested the theater, and said he would as lief do a sum as follow a plot on the stage. He could not, or did not, give any reasons for his literary abhorrences, and perhaps he really had none. But he could have said very distinctly, if he had needed, why he liked the books he did. I was away at the time of his great browning passion, and I know of it chiefly from hearsay. But at the time Tolstoy was doing what could be done to make me over. Clemens wrote, That man seems to have been to you what Browning was to me. I do not know that he had other favorites among the poets, but he had very favorite poems, which he liked to read to you, and he read, of course, splendidly. I have forgotten what piece of John Hayes it was that he liked so much, but I remembered how he fiercely reveled in the vengefulness of William Morris's Sir Guy of the Dolorous Blast, and how he especially exalted in the lines which tell of the supposed speaker's joy in slaying the murderer of his brother. I am threescore years and ten, and my hair is nigh turned gray, but I am glad to think of the moment when I took his life away. Generally, I fancy his pleasure in poetry was not great, and I do not believe he cared much for the conventionally accepted masterpieces of literature. He liked to find out good things and great things for himself. Sometimes he would discover these in a masterpiece new to him alone, and then, if you brought his ignorance home to him, he enjoyed it, and enjoyed it the more, the more you rubbed it in. Of all the literary men I have known, he was the most unliterary in his make and manner. I do not know whether he had any acquaintance with Latin, but I believe not the least. German he knew pretty well, and Italian enough late in life to have fun with it, but he used English and all its alien derivations as if it were native to his own air, as if it had come up out of American, out of Missourian ground. His style was what we know, for good and for bad, but his manner, if I may difference the two, was as entirely his own as if no one had ever written before. I have noted before this how he was not enslaved to the consecutiveness in writing which the rest of us tried to keep chained to. That is, he wrote as he thought, and as all men think, without sequence, without an eye to what went before or should come after. If something beyond or beside what he was saying occurred to him, he invited it to his page, and made it as much at home there as the nature of it would suffer him. Then, when he was through with the welcoming of this casual and unexpected guest, he would go back to the company he was entertaining, and keep on with what he had been talking about. He observed this manner in the construction of his sentences, and the arrangement of his chapters, and the ordering of, or disordering, of his compilations. 
Nowhere is this characteristic better found than in Mark Twain's autobiography. It was not a style. It was unselfconscious thought. I helped him with a library of humor, which he once edited, and when I had done my work, according to tradition, with authors, times, and topics carefully studied in due sequence, he tore it all apart, and chucked the pieces in wherever the fancy for them took him at the moment. He was right. We were not making a textbook, but a book for the pleasure rather than the instruction of the reader. And he did not see why the principle on which he built his travels and reminiscences and tales and novels should not apply to it. And I do not see either, though at the time it confounded me. On minor points he was, beyond any author I have known, without favorite phrases or pet words. He utterly despised the avoidance of repetitions out of fear of tautology. If a word served his turn better than a substitute, he would use it as many times in a page as he chose. End of chapter 4 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Fall 2006